started good uh so today we have uh jared wolf um aka secret dojo who is the author of a uh, well-known uh, feather feather format a board for the nrf 9160 and also an experienced uh, zephyr developer so uh welcome jared and uh your the floor is yours awesome thanks carlos um thanks for uh, joining my presentation on developing hardware for zephyr um, I'm honored to be here among many talented programmers, developers, um, also many of the people who are working on Zephyr every day, including Carl's, which is kind of cool. Um, so thank you very much for putting on this event and uh, let's get going. So uh, I kind of went over a background of myself last presentation. I'll just do it quickly here for those who, of you who are new. Um, who am I? Um, I'm Jared. Uh, I'm the owner of the Cir of Circuit Dojo, uh, sole developer of the NRF 9160 Feather, among other things. Um, I, in a previous life, um, I've cut my teeth in Silicon Valley, developing hardware uh, for for startups and large companies. So all, I'm all over the place. Um, but now I help uh, my clients focus on making their products reality, especially around um, anything Nordic related. I'm a Nordic fanboy. Um, so along with my consulting, I've stumbled on my way to a happy accident, which is the, uh, the, the NRF 9160 Feather. Um, I designed it from the ground up to use um, some of the great features in the NRF 9160 low, low power. It also has some added hardware features, super low power, deep sleep, um, dual UFL connectors for both GPS and LTE antennas, um, onboard storage. So that's the North flash there kind of right in the middle, um, battery charger, things like that. It's got a SIM card holder on the bottom side, along with an accelerometer from ST. Um, the picture you're looking at, um, I've actually personally assembled it. Um, and maybe Carl's can even attest to how crazy it is to assemble one of these by hand. Um, it's a four-layer Oshpark board, um, and then all the components are, are uh, DigiKey purchased. So I won't go much into the depth of like kind of the hardware edge of the side of things, prototyping, laying things out, things like that. But I will go through kind of the process of bringing the device into Zephyr and getting that going. Um, but I will share some pictures first because pictures are fun. Um, so this is like me actually building the board you saw earlier uh, on the bench. So let's dive into the device tree. Um, so we got a prototype hardware. Um, what are we going to do with it? Uh, so Zephyr has some great built-in samples, examples. But how do we get the previously non-existent board working with Zephyr? Uh, the first place to look how Zephyr defines hardware um, is all within kind of like the device tree. So let's 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 dive into the device tree a little bit here. Zephyr allows you to define all the functionality of your board in a, in a standardized way. So it's the same across all the boards in kind of the Zephyr environment. Um, you can use your board with many of the included Zephyr samples, um, and for the most part, they just work. Most of the time, uh, device tree files are stored within the um, in the Zephyr in the Zephyr repo directory under the boards directory. Um, the the boards then are kind of sorted by architecture. So you got ARM, RISC, all the kind of combinations in there. Um, so when you're when when you're de developing your board uh, device definitions, and um, you'll want to make sure you put it in the right category. Uh, when you first, when you finish developing your device tree entry, you'll find that things, like I said, just just work. Um, there's not a lot of hardware, lower level tweaking, anything like that you have to do. That's one of the main kind of superpowers of Zephyr, and it's really excited to being to be able to create a board and be like, all right, I just want to use the Blinky example, compile it for that board, it works. Um, the only caveat is, if there aren't any drivers for certain devices that you have on your on your board, you might have to add it. Uh, developing and publishing your device tree definitions also make it a ton easier for your fellow Zephyr developers and your customers to use your board. Um, if, you, if you're all about making it easier for developers, this should be a no-brainer. So that's one thing that I did very early on as I went in, I went through and I looked at, um, I'll go into the details of this next, but went in and looked at the NRF 9160 and saw how Nordic had done their uh, device tree entries. 
So one way that you can make your life a ton easier is basing your device trees on ones that already exist, kind of like what I just mentioned. For the NRF9160 Feather, I use the NRF9160 Development Kit as a reference to create um, all the dev necessary device tree files necessary to get all the NRF9160 Feather working. Here's an output from the LS from the Zephyr Board's ARM directory. Um, <laughs> you don't have to, don't worry about it. Don't, you have to bother counting. There are 203, 230 entries in the screenshot and that is growing every day. Uh, this is actually from the NRF Connect SDK. So this is actually a little bit behind what uh, Zephyr Master is. So there's probably even more now, who knows? Um, so now that you're, then now that you know that everybody is doing it, so I'm gonna peer pressure you into creating your own board definitions and publishing them to the Zephyr repository. Uh, let's look at the details um, and the makeup of a device definition in Zephyr. So we'll do that next, and then we'll get to publishing that at the end. So here's our basic device tree structure. Let's take a, um, the NRF52 development kit as an example. It's more bare bones than the NRF9160. Um, and let me hit on some of the most important files. Uh, there's a, there's a device K config file where you kind of create the configuration variables that you can use later on in code. These are things that are kind of board specific, um, turning on a DC DC uh, um, power supply that's built into the device is a good example for the NR52. Um, the NR52A32 MDK def config is a similar to, uh, is where, you, is similar to the prj.conf. So, this is where you can set your configuration configuration variables that will propagate to your applications that are always like default to this specific device. Um, so there, these are the features you can use no matter what. Like NR52, it's got Bluetooth. Let's like let's just turn it on by default. Um, there's also a dot def config, which is also um, selecting variables or setting things um, as that are kind of more in the K config. All of these things are very similar. Um, they all kind of do it in the end, accomplish the same thing by enabling or creating variables, um, configuration variables, and then enabling them. Um, and then importantly, in the doc folder, that's where all your restructured text and documentation for your board is located. Um, I would definitely take a look at one that already exists and see how it's already laid out. And then if you do create your own and publish your own, definitely go in there and add your own photos, your own copy, your own your own information about your board to make sure um, you're able to tell the story. Because that actually gets published to places like the um, like Nordic's documentation, like the like the Zephyr documentation, that's all going to be public for people to view. So you want to make sure it's uh, it's useful for folks who are using it. Um, finally, the start of the show. Um, if you look down there at the bottom there, the DTS file. Um, this is where all of the kind of board definitions live. Um, more complicated boards like the NRF9160 Feather, the dev, dev kits, things like that, they actually require multiple board definitions. Um, this is due to the kind of trust zone configuration of the device because there's a secure and non-secure. Um, that's a subject for probably another talk altogether, but um, that's just something to bear in mind. If you do end up working on a device that has a uh, trust zone, you might have to set up two sets of, uh, set up a common and then two sets of device uh, tree definitions. So make sure um, when you are doing this, um, I mean, give credit where credit is due. Uh, Nordic definitely gets 100% credit for the work that um, I basically just tweaked to make the NRF 9160 feather work. Um, so they get that. And then uh, compatible defines. Um, so we'll, we'll go into like the, what this little area is in the beginning of this DTS file. So this is in the common one, I believe. Um, there are some kind of properties that you can set, model, compatible, and then there's also nodes like chosen, uh, compatible, defines kind of like the what the root device um, device binding is called essentially. And that actually is another YAML file within the, the board directory. And that helps um, Zephyr kind of organizing and reference maybe even a, a lower level board or a lower and directory, which is more applicable to uh, how your board works with Zephyr. And that's actually assigning some 
some interfaces to important inter uh, in important things related to Zephyr, including the console, the uh, shell UART, the MCU manager. Um, for instance, for, for the Anafinder 160 Feather, all those things actually go to the same interface. So when I'm using the bootloader, it's using UART0. When I'm using the console for debugging, uh, that's going to be UART0. So those are pretty critical to set up at the beginning. And you just want to make sure um, if you have, if you're basing yours off in another uh, set of device definitions, you just got to set it to whatever you're going to use. Um, here's an example of an LEDs node that's pretty much below that section in that um, device tree definition. Um, you know that you notice that the NRF9160 Feather has only one LED definition, LED underscore zero or the blue underscore LED. Um, but if you wanted to add more, if you had a red LED or if you had a green LED, um, you could totally define those here as well, just underneath each one. Uh, for the blue LED section here, you'll notice that um, we're also defi defining the GPIO, which gives you the port and the pin number and then like how it's operated, either active low or active high. So the cool thing about Zephyr is it, you, you just set what it does. So active low or active high. And then when you say turn on in code, it'll actually account for the fact that you set it for active low or active high and do it. So in this case, if it's active low, it'll pull it low. It'll let current flow through um, a high side LED. Um, we'll also talk about connecting LED instances as an alias, and that will be kind of right after this. Um, so you can that will enable you to use kind of some of the basic Zephyr examples um, later on. So we'll get that's an important part, and we'll get to that. Um, and then again, going back up, you have the compatible property, which will uh, which references the device binding or what device binding you're using. Uh, these are located in Zephyr DTS and bindings. Um, if you ever need inspiration, if you ever need to create your own binding for custom peripherals or anything, um, that's a great place to look. Uh, I've recently done that myself just to figure out just how, like, how the heck am I supposed to get this thing to work? Um, and then looking at a device bindings and seeing if there's one similar and kind of doing that. Um, as most specifically related to controlling reset on a HCI UART set up between the NRF9160 and NRF5284040. Um, here's a button definition. Um, you see maybe some of the same components as you did in the GPIO LEDs. Um, you, you can see that the compatible is using a different device binding. So instead of GPIO LEDs, it's GPIO keys. Um, also including in the GPIO section, some other modifiers for this GPIO. For, so for instance, because it is an input, uh, we're actually setting um, we're setting with a pull-up definition, but you can set up with a pull-down, so on and so forth. And again, um, for like any type of interrupts, you're actually, you can also set the GPIO active low flag. All right, aliases, this is the fun stuff. So also in the same area, the device de definition, basically right below the LEDs and switches and things. And so um, you might notice this section. Um, this is gonna help you rename uh, a node to a certain alias. So you could have a blue LED, but maybe you wanna set that as the default LED for your project. So LED zero is used across Zephyr. Um, and for, for example, like if, you, if you're gonna use the blink um, sample, this is going to be using that alias to, to set that LED to blink when you compile and load it on your device. Um, similarly, bootloader dash LED zero, um, this is gonna be the LED that turns on on your device when you put it into MCU boot. Uh, as you explore Zephyr more, you'll undoubtedly need uh, some some type of new alias to get working with something. Um, this is this is where you can make it happen. Uh, for example, um, some Nordics examples, uh, asset tracker examples, they use uh, a, an accelerometer uh, alias, so you can actually alias a different accelerometer if you needed to. Um, as a side note, you definitely do not want to modify the device tree files within Zephyr for like one-off examples. So for instance, if you wanted to add an Excel ROMer for like a one-off instance, um, you might want to do that in the in an overlay file in the project itself rather than doing it in the uh, Zephyr repo, unless you think um, it's something that you 
it's going to be used for everything. It's just good to keep. And in that case, you probably want to commit that change. Um, referencing um, some of Nordic's device bindings here in the compatible section, um, this will help Zephyr find um, the Nordic specific uh, TWI master or SQC master. Um, this is actually, I believe it's something where it's actually the device binding is outside of the Zephyr or vanilla Zephyr. So that's one thing that gets pulled in. Um, if you have like a, uh, if you have a, a host project like the NRF SDK, um, they actually have a west.yaml and then all that stuff gets brought in magically, which is another crazy awesome part of Zephyr. Um, and also I might be outdated here. Um, you guys can definitely correct me, but um, at least in, uh, in 1.5.0 of the NRF Connect SDK, um, the pins here are still defined. Um, so if you have multiple ports, your your first port is 0 to 31, next port is 31 to um, 31 to 63, so on and so forth. So um, th it's not exactly the same way that the GPIOs are defined for the LEDs in some cases. Um, you just some, that's something you have to bear in mind if you have a, de a device with multiple ports. Um, and then for, and then you can see for this is ISRC, so I actually have a, uh, a low power RTC on here as well. So I'm defining that as the PCF85063A. Um, the at 551 is actually the hex address. So you can all see that in the reg area, in the reg property there. Um, this is a device actually that didn't have support in Zephyr. So I actually had to create like a basic driver that was using the timer API, I believe, just to be able to kind of like set a very basic timer with seconds, just like 60 seconds, set a timer, get a, you know, get an interrupt. Um, and the cool thing is, again, about Zephyr is that there are so many kind of open-ended APIs that you can use with these devices to kind of abstract away some of the hardware stuff that you don't really have to worry about it. And it can be swapped in and swapped out with something else, which is very cool. Um, and once you're comfortable with all your device definitions, um, you've got it all set up, you got your R squared C, you got your all your aliases, your LEDs, so on and so forth, it's time to test them. So there are a bunch of samples, like I've alluded to probably three times now, four times now in this uh, presentation, that there are some awesome um, samples included in, in Zephyr uh, that you can use to kind of test your boards. Um, except like the Blinky example um, to test the onboard LED button is, just, again, just very basic um, testing. Make sure your, your aliases are correct and your board or your button definitions are correct. Um, Another one that I took advantage early on when I was kind of testing and validating the NRF 9160 Feather was the little FS uh, ex example. Um, it's in Zephyr samples, subsys FS sample, uh, little FS. And um, you guys can check it out in my notes. Um, I, when I post this, I'll have my notes in here and you guys can check it out. Um, and that was great for just testing, make sure I could talk to the external flash, but also operate it as a little, you know, format it as little FS and write and read from it, which is cool. Um, and then on the Nordic side, you got the AT client example uh, from the NRF Connect SDK, which is useful, very useful for the NRF9160, um, just for basic debugging, connecting, um, writing manual AT commands to the NRF9160. So super handy. Um, and then zooming into the little FS uh, example here, you'll notice that there's a couple uh, files that I contributed for the NRF Circuit Dojo um, NRF9160 Feather. Um, you'll see the, 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 the .conf and the .overlay, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, these are kind of modifying um, what the default configuration and overlay in DTS files are. Um, so very handy. Um, so, for example, if you're if you wanted to create a new alias, um, you would do that in the dot overlay file, um, and think of it as like a specific DTS diff. So, in case of this example, this overlay was used to remap um, a storage partition um, information to the external to the external spy flash. So that's what that was used for. Um, the dot conf um, again, it's like supplementary to your prj.com, but it's board specific. Um, that way you can use multiple targets for the same device. Anyways, um, 
any 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 differences, we'll be able to handle it. You'll be able to handle it in that dot .conf and um, dot .overlay. So the dot .conf, you can add in board specific, um, enables configuration variables, things like that. So I'm not gonna eat this dead horse. But here's an example of um, an output from a little FS example um, that is pro properly working. This will just got it up and running on the board I have here on my desk. Um, you can you can check out all the samples and drivers that I put together for the NRF9160 Feather, many of them are, which are based on the kind of the original ones, um, just in maybe enabling MCU boot or making some mild, uh, mild uh, changes to make sure that um, it's working on the board because uh, there are some asterisks when it comes to the NRF9160 Feather. Um, but you can check out that link. Um, And once you're happy with your work, uh, it's time to submit a pull request, because why not, um, to uh, merge it with Zephyr. So the best way to do this is to fork uh, uh, Zephyr uh, generally at master, so you don't have to do any kind of re crazy rebasing or anything like that, um, just the latest master branch. Um, this is an, an example of commit message from me updating some of the board definition for the NRF9160 Feather. Um, every commit includes an area where you're kind of adding a, uh, a summary and then a longer description and then like a signed off by section, which is basically your um, just because sometimes there are other people actually committing these things for you. So just making sure that you get proper credit. Um, it's just also just how they do it here. It's just the format that the product is focused on keeping. Um, and then make sure you're only including your .conf, your um, def the, the default conf files, the TTS, or um, the restructured text files and like no no license files, no like markdown readmes or anything like that. Just um, a great way to make sure that you have the right things is just check out another board definition and just be like, all right, yep, I have that, I have that, I have that, good. Um, for Nordic based projects, um, it takes some time eventually for, um, so if you commit it to the Zephyr repo, it takes some time for it to propagate into the NRF Connect SDK. Um, that's just the way that, I mean, the team has to go through and actually kind of pull changes from Zephyr and put it into their own. Um, so that's just something you got to bear in mind. Um, if you if you do need it, you can always copy or, you know, put your board definitions in NRF Connect SDK. Um, that way you can actually use it even though it's not there. Um, it might make it a little bit more difficult for your customers or people who are using your boards, but eventually it will all merge, merge together um, and get there. So, And then uh, another way you can also do it is you can actually pop um, an entry into the West YAML file for NRF Connect SDK or really anything. If you have maybe another SDK from another um, another vendor that you're using, you can actually pop in a, another a GitHub um, or Git address there and it'll you can set the target path to the kind of definitions folder you want to set it to and it'll pull it in for you. And um, there's not a lot of like copy pasting, figuring out where to put things. It's just kind of done for you when you do a, a West update. Um, and that is uh, pretty much it for setting up, or let's get going with hardware on uh, on Zephyr. Um, just a, an example here, uh, but thank you for taking the time to check out this uh, presentation. Hope you've learned a little bit about hardware on Zephyr. Um, slides available at the, the address below. You can feel free to sign up. I'm also um, a little thank you discount for folks who, if anybody's interested in the NRF9160 Feather. Um, you can also check on my website, my blog at jerrywolf.com. I've written a ton of articles on Zephyr and NRF9160. Um, so I hope you found it useful for your projects. And I think we got we got about five minutes to, for questions or a little bit more considering there's nothing after this. But um, yeah, feel free to, we can definitely open this up for questions. Note that I've muted uh, everybody or everybody has been uh, logged in muted. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself or type it on the chat. So I, I have one myself, uh, Tourette. Uh, what's the, yeah, what was the sort of the impression you got um, when you started contributing to Zephyr? Was it friendly enough or what, what did you feel like there was a wall there? Uh, um, how was the first experience of the uh, first contribution experience for you? 
Yeah, I wasn't a hundred percent sure of what I was. I wasn't. I wasn't going in with any expectations. Like, oh man, like I'm gonna have to like commit stuff to the repo. Like this is crazy. Like, it's a big project. Um, and I know you're you're very much involved with like heading things up there. Um, so it was like it was good to have um, folks in Nordic there because then I felt more comfortable doing it. But I was like, all right, just gotta do it. So um, everybody was super nice. They were really helpful. Um, if I, if I had to change anything, the feedback was almost immediate. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll just do a force push, push it back up. And, um, sometimes people are busy, but most of the time things get done pretty fast. And as, as it was a great experience, honestly. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks for the feedback. Hey, Jared, this is Maureen. Thanks for your presentation. Um, what yeah. was your biggest challenge when you were creating this board definition? It seems like things went really smoothly, but but were there things that didn't? Hmm. The um, There were definitely some things where I didn't, I, I was going into this where I had like zero, almost zero experience in Zephyr at the time. So um, there was definitely some things like, how do I, because I was used to like defining devices in like, header files like like so it's very different going to device tree to some extent um so there were some stuff like figuring out how to get the um like the external flash going and things like that where it's just like i didn't quite know all this all the things to pop in like fortunately there's a lot of great examples of people who it's gotten to the point where zephyr's there's not enough stuff and enough projects and enough device definitions where i found how other people had done it um, so it's kind of hit that critical mass, which is very useful. Um, but I feel like if somebody tried to do it maybe two years ago, they probably had a lot more hard time. They probably need to talk to a developer directly to figure it out. Okay, cool. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jared, for the presentation, for the time, everybody for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it here, I think. Thank you.